Church, our YouTube home anyway of Light on the Corner Church. My name is John Carn. I'm the pastor here at this wonderful church, and we're coming to you from beautiful downtown Montrose, California. I like to call God's country. Let's uh, dive in. We're looking at the prelude to, by the way, thank you musicians for that marvelous music. Anyway, uh, we're looking at the prelude to uh, the Moses delivering the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. We'll be looking at Exodus 19. But before that, uh, let me remind you to hit like and subscribe and to uh, become uh, friends with us here at Light on the Corner Church. We'd appreciate that very much. And we appreciate your cards and letters. So uh, bless your heart. Let's dive in. I, I want to begin by saying I, I found a verse in Isaiah that we never quote. I don't know. Are you good friends with Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10? It says, Go into the rocks, hide in the ground, from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. My goodness, the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. When I read this, I am reminded of my, my old friend, Dr. Stuart Dowerman, who is a, a Messianic rabbi and a, a marvelous, marvelous musician. You should really get to know his uh, music. He's all over the internet. You can find him. But 
Anyway, recently, Stuart reminded me of something that my dad had said uh, that I had forgotten. Isn't that something? Stuart has a marvelous memory. Long ago, Dad said, and thank you, Stuart, for reminding me, my dad said that when we gather for worship, though it is indeed a joyful time, it is not fun and games. Because when we meet together, we meet with the Lord. And there ought to be a sense also of dread. For we meet not just one another, but with the Lord God Almighty, from whom earth and sky and, sky and heaven flee. And when we hear his word, we are responsible for what he tells us. Oh, that's rather ominous. So Dad said, a sense of dread. I had forgotten. Could you ponder that for a moment while we begin with prayer? Holy Father, may we understand you better by the time we're finished today. And may we receive your word with reverence and thankfulness and help us to preach. I humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. Simple outline today. Number one, a voice so terrible. So I'm reading through my Bible. I'm smiling. I'm looking for a blessing in God's word. Perhaps he can bless me with a promise or something today. Uh, happily reading through the book of Hebrews. Now, I'm, I'm not a Hebrew, but I am uh, interested in what God has to say to them. And then I come to this. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. Oh my goodness. What am I supposed to do with this? Well, I don't know who wrote Hebrews, and you don't either, but I know it was written to the Jews who had come to believe in Jesus to warn them against leaving the church behind and going back to the synagogue. The new covenant, but here's the deal, the new covenant is better than the old one. And Jesus is greater than Moses. So the author hearkens back to Sinai and is preparing to remind them that they have come to a better place in Jesus. Now, what immediately strikes me is what an encounter about this passage is what an encounter with the living God is like. This is not a party. Oh boy, finally we get to meet with God. In fact, they begged God to stop speaking. 
This is dread. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? Whoever wrote this book of Hebrews is reminding his people of their holy history and exodus, preparing to receive the law. And he is contrasting what was with what is and what will yet be. That's, that's the first part. A voice so terrible. Second, on Mount Sinai, have you read this scene from Exodus 19? It will broaden your view of what God is like and what the sound of his voice is like. This is actually, uh, this is what Hebrews 12 is based on, Exodus 19. Here are the children of Israel camped out in the foothills of Mount Sinai. We who live here in Montrose know something about the foothills. It's hard to find a, a street that is completely level. Right behind us are mountains. Everything around here is at a slant. We understand foothills. But now the children, children of Israel are camped in the foothills of Mount Sinai. And here's what the text says. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. And then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because Yahweh, the Lord, descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. And the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. A few verses later, the people cried out to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Lord, have mercy. Here's one thing we learn immediately, dear ones. The voice, just the voice of God can kill you. Have you ever thought of that? That's what the Israelites knew. And did you catch the sound? When I read it, there was a very loud trumpet blast. From where? Where would, where would that come from? Did the Israelites bring along their horn section to celebrate? No. A very loud trumpet blast echoed down from the mountain. Now, it doesn't say the trumpet was loud. It says it was very loud. And it grew louder. The trumpet of God. I wonder what that sounded like. But it terrified the people. And then it grew louder and louder and louder. Until everyone in the camp trembled. Thunder, lightning, smoke, shaking. The trumpet of God and then the voice of God. Oh, dear ones, what if we heard the voice of God? What would happen to us? As I said, the Israelites heard it and begged him to stop. Dear ones, God is bigger 
than I think. And he is bigger than you think. The glory of God is overpowering. That means he does not exist to improve our lives or to make us comfortable or to get us more money. He is not here for our benefit. He is not a heavenly bellboy sent to carry our bags when we ring the bell or life gets heavy. He does not exist for us. We exist for him. He is the master. We are the servants. We live and move and have our being for his holy purposes and good pleasure. He is our maker. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. That's the kind of awesome, powerful, terrifying God that you have, dear ones. Do you know this? So that when he speaks, people fear that they might die. That's your God. That's our God. So I immediately say, thanks be to God that he is a God of love. And for some inexplicable reason, this almighty God who spoke the world into being loves us. Praise his name. I don't understand it, but I rejoice in it. Okay, third, and lastly, you have come to Mount Zion. With Sinai in mind, the writer of Hebrews reminds our early believing Jewish brothers and sisters of this. No, he says, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. And you have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a devouring fire. 
Do you believe this? Is your God a devouring fire? With fire and gloom, darkness and smoke, shaking and whirlwind came God's perfect law written by the finger of God and delivered by Moses. This was the dramatic power of God's presence at Mount Sinai, and we would do well to learn from it. In those Ten Commandments, mankind finally learned God's holy expectations. But the truth is, for people who care, they bring despair. Because we do not, and we cannot, keep them consistently. Sinai shows us God and his expectations. I would say that Sinai stands as a symbol of our fear and despair because the law of God gave at Mount Sinai demonstrates just how far we fall short. How can this be? Good people like us. Falling short of God's law? Oh, yes. Why would that be? Because we are sinners. And like Pilgrim, Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, who carried a heavy burden on his back, we carry around the burden of sin until we are released of our burden by the bringer of the new covenant. But first, we have to admit the truth. We are indeed sinners. But there's good news in the New Covenant. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Romans 8, 3. Isn't that good news? Jesus died for us. So where does that leave us? Hebrews has a helpful warning for Jew and Gentile alike. We should pay attention to it. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we, if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. Sobering words. Let me close with this story. It's one I bet you haven't heard. One night, a uh, British evangelist, this was uh, quite a while ago now, a uh, British evangelist, Hay Aitken, preached to a large audience in Bristol, England, on the text, you must be born again. So said Jesus. You must be born again. There in the congregation that night was a brilliant young man, and he has kind of a funny name, Horatio Bottomley. Horatio Bottomley. He's a very gifted guy, though. He listened intently. He heard from the preacher at the end of the sermon, he called all who were there to trust in the grace of Christ and to commit their lives to Jesus Christ. And Horatio knew the call was addressed to him, too. He was deeply moved by the message, the verse, and the invitation. But 
he said. Yes, but not now. I'll run my own life first. That sounds familiar to me because that's how I first responded to the gospel. I'll run my own life first. And that's exactly what he did. Horatio Bottomley made a fortune and a name for himself as the champion of the people's rights. He was a lawyer. He exposed swindlers and prosecuted criminals with great vigor. And then when Bottomley was 63, this one who had exposed the crimes of others was himself convicted of fraud and then sentenced to seven years in prison. While he was there, another man visited him and asked to pray with him, and Bottomley said that that would be fine. And in the course of their conversation, the other man said, told his story, and he said, yes, it was many years ago now that I was in Bristol and I heard a preacher named Hay Aitken. And he preached on the text, You must be born again. And I was so deeply moved that I committed my life to Christ that night. And ever since then, Christ has been my all in all. And Bottomley was silent for a time. And then he said, I too heard that searching message. I too was deeply moved. I knew my need of Christ, but I rejected him. And then he said remorsefully, a life without God is a wasted life. Dear ones, the Bible says we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. I'll close right there and leave that between you and the Holy Spirit to do any business together that you need to do. Holy Spirit, intercede for us. Let's bow in prayer. Holy Father, you brought the world into being by the word of your power, and you hold all things together by your sustaining providence. Forgive us for thinking small thoughts about you, and shake us loose from ever thinking that we can get by just fine without you, for we cannot. Thank you for the all-sufficient sacrifice of your Holy Son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.